Eastside Free Will Baptist Church sending out live stream. Uh, we've had a wonderful day today. Hope God has blessed you. It's been a beautiful day outside today. I hope you've had a chance to enjoy some of that. Uh, and today I haven't got out too much. I know yesterday me and my family got out yesterday. It was a beautiful day yesterday. Uh, we went up to Old Rome Mountain. Uh, went up that way, kind of enjoyed some of the sights and so forth. It's a really pretty weekend uh, yesterday and today. So we thank the Lord for that. We're thankful if you're joining us this evening. Appreciate you being with us. If you want to watch us a little later on, a, on Thank You Late, that's fine too. But uh, we do appreciate you taking time to listen to us this evening. I uh, do appreciate everybody <coughs> that was able to come to church uh, this morning. And those that watched us on Facebook and, of course, those that was out in the parking lot. Uh, we did uh, get some things set up to help out the experience out there. Uh, for those that are still coming in their cars, and things appear to go okay. As far as that goes, so we do appreciate everybody that came this morning. Uh, wonderful service this morning, wonderful spirit here, and I hope what was preached this morning helped you out. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that anybody would have that we are living in the last days. Uh, you just kind of look at what things have happened over the last eight weeks, I tell you, it's just something else, and it's really amazing. Uh, when you read the Word of God, when you actually see some of these things it, it, it fold around, not unfold, I should say, around you. We have learned quite a bit. Uh, of course, as you're all well aware, uh, this week here in the state of Tennessee, uh, the 22nd, uh, we have another bunch of reopenings that are going to take place. I think there's going to be some expansion uh, of restaurants and large uh, auditorium type places uh, like theaters and so forth that are going to be able to open up. So that's going to happen this Friday. I think the governor <coughs> is expected to come out and kind of give some uh, guidelines out of Monday or Tuesday of this week. Give us what we can expect, and probably for those that are, that are already opened up, uh, some new uh, guidelines there. So, kind of looking forward to that. Uh, my hope is that hopefully next week, uh, of course, we're going to do Sunday morning service here in the sanctuary as we did uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to continue doing that, following the same procedures we've been told to follow. And then, uh, based on the new guidelines that come out, we'll adjust accordingly. But my hope is, is that uh, hopefully we can catch maybe another service. Next week here in the church, and then I'm kind of eyeballing Wednesday night. Uh, this Wednesday night will be on Facebook Live. Brother Kenny will be with us at six o'clock. Uh, he and Sister Kathy, and then I'll be on about six thirty. But maybe the next Wednesday night, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, uh, we may go ahead and just have the service here at the church. We will continue uh, the live stream, so don't worry about that. Uh, we'll continue that. We hope to uh, get the openings that may take place this weekend. We're hopeful we'll be able to get out and get some things and get more permanent on that uh, and bring some work back in the church to, to make that happen to be more of a permanent basis. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking a step at a time, doing what we can. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, please pray for our, our teachers, our school systems, and, and the ministries at your church that, that deal with children. I mean, there's still a lot of uh, you know, unknowns there, what, what, what one can do. Uh, just to give you some updates on some things, the church youth camp uh, has been canceled for this summer. Uh, that went through the Appalachian Association. I, I saw two. Uh, the Arise Conference of uh, C.P. Townsend, we had planned to send our uh, older kids to that. Uh, we're in the process of raising money to send them to that. Uh, he got home this week and he said that he's going to have to do that virtually. Uh, that was going to be in July. So uh, you're, you're kind of seeing things like that. Uh, folks are real hesitant to do it because, you know, that does deal with children. And then even our school systems here in the area uh, are still trying to come up with plans to, to, to make that work. So we're praying uh, that, that some wisdom and guidance will come down out, like I said, this morning. Uh, you know, they're not the only ones that are, are struggling trying to, to figure what to do. Uh, I know churches are, uh, schools are, any organization that deals uh, with kids are just trying to, to figure out what they can do. So do, so do remember that in your prayers and hopefully as things open up and uh, some opportunities open up there and we get some more things going. I, I can tell you uh, here at the church we are going to do a lot more uh, things online. Uh, talking to Felicia uh, this morning, she is going to try to contact all the kids that's in Patch the Pirate and, and do some things online there with you. Uh, also too, you know, it's Brother Fred that put out more uh, children's church uh, video last uh, Sunday. So we're going to try to get some more out maybe this week. I myself will probably get involved in doing some things like that, as well as some others here in the church, and to try to help out with those ministries until we can get those back uh, 
uh, in, in the church on a regular basis. So do remember that, okay? So uh, so do remember all those things uh, in your prayer list as far as announcements go. I have a lot of folks here on the prayer list that I, I want to uh, share with you, and, and I'll give you updates as I have them. Uh, first off, do remember the uh, family of Danny Williams. We got this one just a few moments ago. Uh, his uh, mother has uh, lost one of her sisters, and then the other sister is in the hospital in the emergency room. Uh, both these uh, aunts of Danny's, I should say, are both 90 years old. One of them over 100 years old, the one that's still living. So, so do remember Danny's family in prayer. Of course, his mother, as we said before, in situations like this, I mean, his mom can't go be with him. Uh, for Danny and Brenda, they can't go up there and then take her to be with, with the one that's in the hospital because they, they just won't let you. I mean, they're in the state of Kentucky, and they're like us here as far as the hospitals go. They're very, being very restrictive on who can visit. So do pray for that situation there. Remember Danny and his family in prayer. Of course, speaking of Brenda, she did have surgery this past week and she's waiting results on those uh, test results that will be around the 28th of May uh, I believe is what she told me so do, do remember uh, Sister Brenda uh, in your prayers as well and we've got several here uh, on the prayer list uh, Sister Neil Fader uh, they're not really sure that she has shingles uh, they're still treating her she's not doing well at all she's not eating a whole lot in the last three or four days so please remember uh, Sister, Sister Nell Fair in your prayers. Of course, Nell will be our oldest, I guess she'll be our oldest member right now, active member. She's 94 years old and, and at the nursing home. So do remember her in your prayers. Remember her family in your prayers too, but the same situation. Uh, they're, they're not able to get out there and be with her like they would like to uh, in a situation like this. So do remember her in your prayers. Remember her family. And then uh, Jenny Bunn, this is a request we put out this morning. Uh, this is a Mary's daughter in law. There's a possibility she may lose her foot. Please remember that lady in your prayers. Remember Mary's family in your prayers. And Mary Godsey and her family, of course, her son suffered from kidney stones. They get rushed to the hospital yesterday. He's doing much better, but do remember him. And then Robert Chambers, this is uh, Pete Wilson's nephew. Uh, they thought they lost him. I got some word that Friday night uh, they didn't expect him to make it. And Saturday he, he recovered a little bit, but he is still, still in critical condition. So remember him. Remember his family in your prayers, and then Sister Ruth and uh, Sister uh, Elsie and Sister Vicky. Uh, all three have some appointments this week, so remember them in your prayers. Ruth, I think, was a neurologist. Uh, Elsie has some tests, and then Vicky uh, has got to have uh, some teeth pulled this week. So remember her in your prayers. And speaking of that, uh, remember Sister uh, Debbie Wilson tomorrow. She's going to have some wisdom teeth removed. And then uh, Sandy Carr, I mentioned that she had a yearly come tomorrow, but they've had to put that off. She's going to have that done here at a later date. So do remember her in your prayer. So far, she's uh, done real good on those. So we pray that that will continue to be the case for her. And remember my wife in your prayer. She's been struggling with DVT uh, for the last uh, eight days. I just can't seem to get that thing to resolve. So remember her. She's probably going to have to go tomorrow and have an ultrasound. And it seems they can't give her something a little stronger uh, to perhaps maybe resolve that. So do remember her in your prayers. And then. Uh, remember the family of uh, Arthur Blevins, we, we mentioned this Wednesday night, uh, his nephew Ricky Campbell passed away, then on top of that, uh, he had a grandson, Alexios Henson, that also died, a very young baby. So remember that family in your prayers, that, that was pretty tough there. And then, uh, of course, the family of Mary and Ellis, uh, whose uh, husband married, he was out here at Ivy Hall, he passed away uh, last weekend, so remember that family in your prayers. And then uh, Pam uh, Wilson. That's uh, Dennis Wilson, who pastors at In Valley Baptist Church. That's his wife. Uh, she passed away with cancer uh, last weekend. So do remember that family in prayers. Remember that church in your prayers. And then uh, just going down through here, uh, we had a lady in our church, Dane, her aunt <clears throat> in Ohio. That's right at 100 years old, but she was diagnosed with the virus, COVID-19. So remember her in your prayers. And her brother, Bud Julian, uh, he's battling C. diff again. So please remember him. Remember Nadine uh, Graybill? Uh, she's been having problems with her ear. Doug Graybill's got to go for an appointment on his back the 1st of June. So do you remember him, Belinda Hester? Uh, do you remember her? Sister Terry was here with us this morning. And uh, she told me that everything checked out fine on her test results. But the one thing they did find was a cyst on her spleen. So we're, we're thankful for that. So do continue to remember Sister Terry in your prayers. And then Hunter McNeil, that's their grandson. He had a real scare this week on his eyes, but he's doing a lot better. Uh, so 
He, he knew the member he had to be first. And then uh, Barbara Stern, her granddaughter, had to have uh, elbow surgery this past week with Bill Miller. Uh, please remember Brother Bill. He's going to have back surgery on the 28th. Uh, he really had a hard time with that. So please remember him. And then uh, Sherry Gregg has got uh, sinus surgery this week. Uh, so we remember her in your prayers. A good friend of mine that was in my youth group in Johnson City, Clayton Wilson, had sinus surgery uh, last week. So he's doing he's doing real well, but uh, do remember them in your prayers. And then uh, just going down the list, uh, Willie, I know that's Elsie's uh, husband, has got an appointment coming up on the 26th where she's been having a lot of blood work done and having to watch that. So do remember him in your prayers, Jules Benny. Uh, just to give you an update on her situation, uh, she's going to have to go for therapy. So they're trying to work with her and her daughter uh, to, to get things set up for her. So do remember that situation in your prayers. She's still at the hospital. And then, uh, Remember Bobby Stout, uh, preacher Bobby Stout uh, from Pleasant Beach. Uh, he had been in the hospital. He's also had some heart uh, procedures done this week at John C. Medical Center. So do remember him. And then uh, Mike Malone, uh, this is a friend of Pete Taylor's. Uh, he's having to take a lot of chemo treatment. So please remember him in your prayers. And then my cousin Donnell uh, in Arizona, she's had to take her treatments once every three weeks. So do you remember her in your prayers? She's uh, really, really got some hard treatments that she's had to take. And then these are a friend of uh, Marsha James, Melinda Jennings. Remember her in your prayers. And then Jake Lewis, he was involved in a very bad uh, car accident and had extensive uh, injuries done. So do remember him uh, in your prayers as well, okay? So do remember all these folks in your prayers. Of course, next uh, Sunday is Memorial Day Sunday. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh, of course, we're going to have service here in the church, follow the same guidelines. Followed the last two weeks, and like I say, if, if the governor opens things up a little differently, uh, we'll adjust accordingly uh, to those uh, guidelines that he puts out. So, kind of encouraged uh, by things that are happening. I just noticed uh, today, to my knowledge, I think there's only three active cases in our county, so very thankful for that. And hopefully, that number will just continue to just disappear and uh, we get this behind us and, and move on. I do have uh, another announcement to make. I talked to Brother Jeff this morning in a car before he left. But Ralph had contacted him and said, as far as he knows, as of today, the tent revival that they had planned in August is still on. So right now that is still on and still going to happen at those dates. So be praying about that. But uh, hopefully the Lord will really get involved there and, and things can keep on. But I'm really looking forward to the tent revival this year. That's kind of uh, very hopeful for that. So, uh, you know, let's get back in the church. And what I mean by that is being able to get back in. in Service and so forth. About the time that tent revival begins, we could really be looking at a very strong and a very good spiritual revival. So, uh, so do remember that in your prayers. Hopefully, God will continue to work that out, and, and, and that can happen uh, as scheduled. I believe it's going to start in August. So do uh, remember that, that in your prayers. That is still on uh, as of this time. Of course, do remember folks traveling. I know that sounds odd for me to say uh, under the circumstances, but we do have folks in Memorial Day that are going to travel. My mother's actually going to come in, uh, fly in next week. So please remember her in your prayers as she flies in. And remember our church family that will be traveling some of this weekend, uh, going out of town for Memorial Day and trying to get some semblance of a vacation. So, so do remember them in your prayers. They have safety of travel uh, to and from their destination. So do remember all of these requests and, and all these folks. And once again, we thank you for joining us tonight. Of course, we're all here in the auditorium. Thank you for being here. I kind of like this. The, the sound's a little better. I know there's a little bit of an echo, but the, the sound's a little better. Plus, too, I think there are some folks outside uh, that are listening that want to drive up and listen tonight. So we uh, we set that up so they could do that. So I'm kind of excited to be here tonight. Kind of excited to get to share the Word of God with you. I hope you enjoyed the sermon this morning. Uh, you know, three things there Jesus told us there in Matthew chapter 24, the latter part of that chapter. Watch, be ready, and be aware. Okay, what's happening? And I trust you as a Christian today that you'll do those things. You know, be watching, uh, be ready, be prepared, and then be aware because I think the return of the Lord is very near. Okay? And this time we'll go to the Lord in prayer after we get done. If you're going to be with us uh, in, in the service tonight, and stay with us at Colossians chapter 3. And I've got my notes here that we left off at verse 3. That's where we'll pick up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us. We need a great thanks, a great service this morning. Thank you for the wonderful singing uh, that we got here this morning. Uh, 
all of the congregations with two specials we got to hear. God, you are so good to us. You bless us so much. And we thank you for what you've done. I mean, and I know we've had to, to, to deal with some things that we did not expect, some seemingly circumstances, but, but Father, we are blessed here in East Tennessee. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And we look around the nation at some of the hardships some of the others have had to put up with and deal with. Just on the virus, but everything in general, Father, we're just thankful for what you have blessed us with. And Father, I pray you continue to outpour your blessings upon us physically, keep us safe. Uh, Lord, I know not only my heart's desire, but every preacher, every church uh, member, uh, everybody in our area, that we love to see things get back to normal as far as that goes. And Father, we're praying for that. We continue to pray for children's ministry. I mean, right now, that is the one thing now uh, that we're trying to really kind of figure out uh, what we can do there. Here in the very near future, as things begin to open up, and Father, it's not just us, but even our schools, our local school systems are all trying to figure out uh, what to do there. There's a tremendous challenge that's coming up on the horizon. Father, I pray you give a lot of wisdom and guidance. I mean, I've got uh, teachers here in my own congregation. I will tell you right now, they're going to try to figure out what to do in that situation to move forward. Father, I pray that you give us the wisdom and guidance necessary to help us on that. And Father, I pray that you be with the parents. I know many of them have had to stay at home. And some of them, I should say, have been at home trying to help their children out with their school studies, their school work. And Father, I pray that you give them the patience that they need in the days ahead as they begin to finish those things up. And Father, we pray for these requests that's been offered up today uh, to be given. And Father, we've got a long list on here. We still have folks that death has visited their doorstep. And Father, I pray that you comfort those families. I mean, it's, death is hard enough to deal with. But a situation like this is that much harder. And my heart goes out to families that have loved ones that have passed away uh, during this time. Uh, what a difficult situation that is, not being able to be there like we'd like to. Uh, Father, for those that had to go to hospitals, uh, Lord, even in that situation, you know, families not able to be there uh, with them in the hospital. So, Father, I pray uh, that you continue to be with them. And you be with all these requests that we've offered up today, those that have taken tests. Those that have procedures coming up in the near future, Father, I pray that your will be done upon their lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one other prayer request that I meant to mention. Remember Junior Gassy prayer? Now, I know he was here uh, this morning, but he was looking at having a pacemaker put in, and that has been put off uh, because of what's happened. So he's got to go through all those tests. He told me this morning. He's hopeful that the VA will get back in contact with him this week and can set the schedule for him to get that done. So do remember him and remember his wife in your prayer. Now, I know we don't mention this a lot, uh, but his wife is suffering from dementia, Lenny. So uh, please remember her uh, when you pray. So, okay. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 is what we left off with last week. I hope you've enjoyed this study in the book of Colossians. Uh, we've got some things to share with you tonight. And as always, we just want to be a help to you and encourage you and, and try to teach you some things about the Word of God that can help you, especially, you know, I always think about Sunday night, uh, trying to share things from the Word of God, and it's about 50-50 preaching and teaching, uh, try to share things from the Word of God that, that hopefully that will help you in the week ahead, and give you things to think about. Uh, I think thinking and meditating upon the Word of God is a good thing. I think more of us can stand to do that, and hopefully we can accomplish those goals in mind. Verse 3, the Bible says, for ye are dead and your life is hid, with Christ in God. That means you're dead in the world and you're alive in Christ. You know, when you get saved, you become a new creation, a new creature. Behold, all things become new. Uh, the Bible tells us, you know, dead in the world, alive in Christ. If you think about baptism and, and what that represents, you, you die in the world and, and rise again with Christ, okay? And that's what baptism represents, what Christ done on Calvary's cross, being laid dead and rising again. You and I, that's symbolic because we are dying to the world rising again alive, renewed in Christ. And that's what the apostle is saying there. You know, the, the title of chapter 3 is Seek the Things Which Are Above. And, and if you're a new creation in Christ, and, and Jesus Christ is your Savior, and now a born-again Christian, you know, start to build up treasure in heaven, okay? Uh, you know, we, we think about building up uh, treasure in this world, and by no means is there anything wrong with that, okay? Uh, you know, I'm like anybody else. I may be a preacher, but I hope one day to retire as well and be able to enjoy some of my retirement. Uh, you know, my retired years, if you will, if I ever get to that point, God allows me to live that life. I like to enjoy that too. So yes, like anybody else, 
I try to put things back and, and, and prepare for that, okay? And there's nothing wrong for, with that. But make sure that you're also putting things in him. And putting a retirement, if you will, a nice strong retirement in him. You say, preacher, how do you do that? And it's not in monetary terms that, that the Bible is speaking here. It's in spiritual terms. And here's the thing. So the best investments that you make to build a retirement in heaven is investing in people, especially people that you love. And you know, you go back to this morning's sermon, uh, being a watchman on the wall. And I would encourage you to study about watchmen uh, in the Bible, how the Bible talks about them. I remember uh, Noah Hutchinson, the late Noah Hutchinson, uh, who was one of those that was interested, in, or I should say that was one of the editors uh, of the Sword of the Lord that I get still in the paper that I still get it there in my church office. Uh, he was one of those admin. He actually had a, a paper, I think he called it, The Watchman on the Wall. Okay? So I would encourage you to study about watchmen. But you go back to those watchmen there. Those watchmen took their job seriously because the things they were watching trying to protect was their own families. Okay? And, and that's the first thing you can look at. You know, in building treasure in heaven, you want your wife or your husband or, or your children, your grandchildren, your brothers, your sisters, or your parents if they're not saved. Uh, your children, okay? Uh, any of those that are dear friends, best friends, maybe co-workers you work with. You may have worked with somebody uh, for X number of years and you've kind of built a close relationship with that individual. Maybe a fishing buddy or somebody you enjoy out doing hobbies with. That's building treasure in heaven and is have those folks know Jesus Christ as their Savior the way you do so that you can spend eternity with them. And that's the treasure in heaven that God wants you to build. And I think that's what the apostle's saying here. You know, and seek those things which are above. Remember, Christ's number one mission statement of any church seeking to save that which is lost. Everything else is a distant sand. Okay? If you remember anything else that you remember that. Jesus Christ is more interested than anything else. He's interested in seeing folks get saved. That's what he wants to see. He wants you to tell folks about him, witness for him, and that matters to Christ more than anything. He says, when Christ, who is our life, verse 4, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. That's talking about the return of Christ. Uh, we think about the rapture of the church. That's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, to the end of that chapter. And the Bible says Christ will return, and those that have already died will come back with him. And all of a sudden, those graves will burst open. Those resurrected new bodies will be reunited with those souls and spirits. It says, we which are alive and remain will rise up in the air to meet them in the air. Ever so shall we be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to that day, that rapture day. We preached a little bit about that this morning. That, that is something as a watchman that I am watching for. But not only as a watchman, it has become more of a thing that I am aware of. Because it is imminent. I, I cannot stress enough how imminent the rapture of the church is. I, I hope you've paid attention the last eight weeks. And I'll probably do a little Sunday school lesson this week online to, to illustrate some of this. We have seen things happen in the last eight weeks. If you go back to Matthew 24, those first 14 verses, okay? We have seen things happen this week that has made those things a reality. And we brought some of that out this morning. And I hope you're paying attention. If you're saying this tonight, if you're watching this, realize the rapture of the church is imminent. I would be very surprised if the rapture of the church does not take place tonight or today. I'm surprised every day. I think Christ in, in that sermon this morning, when he told him, he said, be aware because... From hour to hour, it could happen. Not just the day, but he also brought it down to the hour, if you recall. That's how imminent the rapture of the church is. And here it's mentioned. I mean, we, we see things like this in the Bible. We read and say, Preacher, I've heard that for, for my entire life, but it still hasn't happened. That does not change the fact that it's going to happen. See, that's the thing. It's eventually going to happen. And the probabilities of it happening today are much higher than the probabilities of yesterday or last month or last year or 10 years ago. It's a lot higher right now. We've seen things and have witnessed some things in our own nation. And by no means am I throwing off on the president or the governors or anybody, but we've just seen things in the last eight weeks that make us step back for a minute and think to ourselves, yeah, this could be a reality. I repeat that the COVID-19 virus 
has about two to three percent mortality rate. That means two to three percent of the people that get it actually die from it. Okay, that, that's extremely low. All right, but if you imagine something that that may have approached a ten percent or a fifteen or a twenty percent, how many more things would be shut down? How many more freedoms would be restricted if it was that high? See, that's the things we've witnessed in the last eight weeks. That has to make a, a person that studies the Word of God and a student of prophecy step back and kind of go, hmm, that, that's, yeah. I, I see now how that can happen. And, and you see the apostle here, he mentions about the return of Christ. See, our life is not based here, as the Bible says. He says, when Christ who is our life. My life is in Christ. I am literally in His hands. When I got saved at the age of nine, I put myself in the hand of Christ. I belonged to Him. He saw fit to call me to preach. Sometimes I'm as surprised by that as some of you watching are surprised by that. But He did. Okay? And I've tried to fulfill the obligation that I think is important to fulfill for the calling that He has given me as best that I can. Those of you that have had callings of the Lord, you've done the best you can to fulfill the obligation that Christ has called you to. But my life belongs to Him. I'm here because of Him. Hey, if Jesus Christ was not alive, I would not be in this pulpit tonight. I would not waste my time. If Christ were dead and He was still in His tomb, I would not waste my time in Christianity. That is the power of the resurrection. But because the tomb is empty, I've seen it with my own two eyes, and because I know Jesus Christ is alive, one need only to study the Bible to realize the reality of the birth, the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. One only need to read the Bible to understand that reality. Okay? So, He is our life. One day He's coming back. Hope you're ready for that. Verse 5. It says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Now, the word mortify means there, put to death. Okay? So, what is the Bible saying the things you need to put to death? Here's what it says in verse 5. First one is mentioned, fornication. That's sex outside of marriage. Let me remind you, okay, once again, back in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Christ talked about immorality. He says they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. That means anything goes in marriage. We now have gay marriage. Now, regardless of your feelings on that, God still calls that sin. Whether you like it or not, God's not going to change his mind on it. Therefore, I cannot change my mind on it. I still view it as sin, just like the Bible does. Okay? It's sin. But it's legalized in the United States of America. We just saw this week in the state of Utah that they have lifted it being a felony if you're involved in polygamy. That's a man with multiple wives or a wife with multiple husbands. Okay? We are now seeing that begin to be on the fast track, if you will, to being legalized in America. And it's going to be. It will be. Okay? You, you can mark it down. It will be. When we see other things like living together. God still condemns that. Whether you like it or not, you can get mad at me and give me a little mean face where you want to, but here's the thing. Argue with him. He's the one that says it. Okay? If you win that argument, you let me know. All right? So, living together. I mean, we can go all the way down that list, but all those things Christ said that you would see in the home, that's what he means by marrying and giving in marriage, is that you would see the breakdown of the home at the same time. Anything would go in marriage. Anything. Because that's how it was in the days of Noah. Immorality began to reach a crescendo and got worse and worse and worse. And here we see fornication, the first thing brought out. The next thing we see put there is uncleanness. Uncleanness, once again, has to do with immoral behavior. Uh, let's be honest. We see that all over our nation. We see that all over this world. Once again, that is one of the precursors of the return of Christ. See, where Jesus dealt with immorality in Matthew 24, that's what he called out when he talked about the days of Noah. If you go back to God the Father in the book of Genesis, when speaking of the flood, God kept saying, all I see is violence. Now, before anybody gets on here, well, you're, I'm not talking about guns. I'm talking about violence, period. All right? Man don't need guns to 
kill people. He can do it in other means. We all know that. So let's get off our gun mind. That's not the issue. I've yet to see a gun jump up and shoot somebody without somebody pulling the trigger. So that's what gets me riled up as a Christian and just watching that. They'll get on TV. Well, that gun, that gun didn't kill nobody. So and so who pulled the trigger killed those people. That's the person who stands in a courtroom and gets charged. I get to see any weapon, whether it's a gun, bow and arrow, a bomb, or, or any type of weapon, stand trial in a courtroom. People do. People do those things. People commit those acts of violence. We take that a step further. Abortion. I don't care where you fall on that. The Bible says that's murder. If you go back to the seven sins that God hates, hands that shed innocent blood. Understand something. There's only one group of people in this world that would be classified as innocent in the eyes of God. And that are people that are under the age of accountability. That do not know right from wrong. God even called Jonah out on that. If you go back and you read the story of Jonah, the Bible says that Jonah went out and preached yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He preached his heart out. The Bible says that the city of Nineveh repented. Okay? They were involved in immorality, if you will, and all kinds of things. Immorality and violence was marking their city. They repented of those things and turned away from them. The Bible says that Jonah went outside the town to watch God's wrath fall upon that city. The Bible said that God's wrath did not. Because they repented, God was merciful. The Bible says that Jonah got mad. I mean, he really got mad. If you've read that story, the Bible says that God had a gourd grow over him to give him shade. And then Jonah got mad the next day when a worm came and ate the gourd that was giving him shade, and the shade was gone. God came down to Jonah and said, Jonah, you are mad over something that you did not build or you did not even plant. I did that. And you got mad because it disappeared the next day. He says, why are you so mad that I have spared a city down there that is full of, of thousands of people that don't know the right hand from the left? Who do you think those are, folks? That's children. Okay? So fornication, uncleanness. We're going a little bit further there. Inordinate affection. That is an unhealthy type obsession with either a person or things. Let me tell you something. Things in this world pass away. I have yet to see anybody that has died be buried with their, a bunch of their possessions. I mean, the pharaohs of Egypt were buried with those things, and look how that turned out. I mean, grave robbers. I mean, they go in those tombs now, and those pharaohs have hardly anything left. Okay? I'm just telling you, you're not going to take those things with you. The only thing you're going to take with you is yourself. And that's the part of you you better make sure is right with God. So in order to affection, we go a little bit farther, we see evil conspicuous, conspicuous, concupience, I can't pronounce that word. Anyways, it means sexual lust. Evil sexual lust. I think we see a lot of that going on. It's kind of been interesting that a lot of these are dealing with morality. Okay, and the immorality that is happening. We're seeing a lot of that in our world today and in our nation today. We get to the next thing here, and covetousness. You, know, you don't covet what somebody else owns. Be happy with what God's blessed you with. You know, I, I think to myself, at my home, I'm just content and happy with what God's blessed me with. You know, my wife, my children, the, the, the few possessions that I have, I'm content with those things. You know, and I'm pleased with those things. And that's the way that we ought to be. Don't covet other people's things. But we seem to have a problem in our country with those things. He goes on there and says, which is idolatry. Now, those things we are to mortify or put to death in our life. Those things need to come to an end. Okay? Those are things that need to die within us if we want to be successful 
Christians and servants for the Lord. He says in verse 6, For which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The wrath of God, I repeat once again, the days of Noah. Okay? What Christ says in Matthew 24, what God said in Genesis chapter 6, I believe, and speaking of the days of Noah, nobody survived the days of Noah but eight people. I don't care what you think about the flood, whether you believe it or you don't. Eight people survived. Period. That's it. Eight people. And the eight people that survived was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughter-in-laws. They made it inside the ark because they chose to trust God and take him seriously at his word that judgment is coming. Now, all, all, everybody likes to hear a preacher preach on God's mercy and grace and love. Hey, I even like preaching on that myself. But there's also such a thing as God's judgment and wrath. And what Christ says as it were in the days of Noah, what God says when it comes to violence in the days of Noah, friend, that judgment is hanging over this world. Okay? You are saved for heaven. But make no mistake, you're saved from hell if you know Christ as your Savior. And you're saved from the judgment and wrath of God. See, God's wrath hangs over people like this. And the children of disobedience. As I've told the church before here at Eastside, when Christ makes his return at the end of the tribulation period in what is officially called the second coming, I want to be behind him, not in front of him. Because those in front of him are going to face his wrath. Those behind him are safe from it. Remember that. Look at the next thing here. In the which you also walk some time when you live in them. Paul says, yeah, you were a part of that. But now you are forgiven. And because you are forgiven, work to put those things to death in your life. In them. Get rid of them. Put your mind on things of God, not on things of this world. He goes on that. But now you also put off all these. There's also some other things. We're talking about outward things. These have more to do with some inward type things. He said, put off all these anger. You know, there's a lot of people with short fuses right now because they've been, you know, holed up for X number of weeks. And I think a very sad result of this quarantine, I think it's sad, is the fact that I've been hearing the number of cases of domestic abuse have gone up. That's a sad state of affairs. That is not good. Okay? Not good at all. You know, I, I think, you know, you would think in a situation like this in quarantine, your hope would be is that people would get closer together, not farther apart. Unfortunately, we have seen that. That goes back to that immorality thing, I'm afraid. But you've got to learn to deal with anger. Hey, yeah. Folks out there at the Walmart doing the best they can. You know, if you go out there and, and, and excuse my leg, but be a horse at the rear end and not go in the door they tell you to go in, that's on you, not on them. That's your fault. You know, I went to Lowe's yesterday. And, you know, the garden center, and they have their front, end, their front entrance and their exit. And I walked up, and I thought, yeah, I want to look at something the garden center first. And I made my way, and the garden center said, exit only. You know what I done? I didn't go just walking on in there. Because the sign clearly said, exit only. I didn't get mad. I didn't get upset. It's okay. I mean, they got rules. I'm going to follow them. So I turned around and walked back to the entrance where it said to enter. I walked in there like they said to, and then made my way to the garden center, checked on a few prices of some things, and then done the rest of my shopping. Okay? You've got to put off stuff like anger, friend. But a lot of times you're going to find out the anger that you have is your own fault. Look at the next thing here. Wrath. Anger and wrath kind of go hand in hand. I mean, why are you taking out your wrath on somebody else? Everybody in this world is just trying to do the best they can like anybody else can. I like what Brother Richard Adams used to say on the radio years ago. He's a pastor of this church. Be nice to everybody. Everybody's having it rough. Okay? Anger, wrath, malice. You know, I would hope that people would not take advantage of this situation maliciously. Unfortunately, some may have. 
Then the next thing you're blasting. You know, I'll jump on my congregation like anybody else would. Don't get on Facebook and talk down and run somebody down to the ground. But the Bible don't teach that. And if that's what you're using social media for, get off of it. You don't need to be on it. You don't run people around, especially if you're a child of God. If you've got a problem with somebody, you don't get on social media and run them down. You call them up and talk to them. Find out what the difference is, put it behind you, and continue on as friends like you should. Oh, by the way, right after blasphemy, you got filthy communication out of your mouth. See, all those things work hand in hand. All those things, if you're a Christian, you need to mortify and put behind you. Look at verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Nobody likes to be lied to. Okay? God don't even like people lying. I mean, he says in, in the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not tell a lie. Don't lie. The children of God got to be honest with one another. And here's the thing. You may talk to me, and you may think, well, you're not telling me something. I'm not telling you something because I don't know. I remember talking to somebody about three weeks ago. We talked about having church, and, and uh, you know, I said, well, this is my tentative plan, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I really don't know. And I said this morning, you know, this week, we're expecting the 22nd that there's some more things to open up. The government's going to put out some more things. But all that could change between now and Friday. So in reality, I really don't know. All I can do is tentatively say that this is what we're going for. But all that can change. If you don't know, just say so. I don't know. Okay? Look at verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, the apostle said it's like a thing of clothes. If you become saved, you need to take off the coat of the world and cast it aside. That's what mortify means. Put it to death. You don't put that coat of the world back on. Here you see, after he says about lying to one another and put off the old man, that's putting off that coat. He says, now he put on the new man. What you need to do is put on a new coat. Now, I know I've got my same suit jacket, but just pretend this is my new coat. And put on the new coat. And wear it. All right? That, that, that's the problem a lot of times we have as Christians. We, we, we'll, put on, we'll put on our new coats or our Christian coats and we'll come to the house of God. And then as we leave the house of God, we take them off and leave them back in the back. You, know, you don't need to be doing that. People see through that. Now, for those of you that are watching, they say, well, that's why I don't go to church because of hypocrites. No, 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 no. That's your fault. If you're blaming or basing your church attendance on how other people act, good luck explaining that to God because that boat won't hold water. Your rear end needs to be in church. You need to be worshiping the Lord. You need to get your life straightened out. You don't base your life on the actions of other people. You base your Christian life on what Christ does. He is your, I should say, the one that you need to be looking up to, not people. So folks that want to drive by in front of the church say, well, there goes so-and-so in church. He said, yeah, I heard him do say, you know, I, that's why I don't go to church. No, friend, that will not hold water with Christ, and that definitely will not hold water with God. That's on you. You need to have a relationship with the Lord. You don't base that on other people. People on each side do not base their relationship on Christ based upon Justin D. They base that upon Jesus Christ. You better do the same. So, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created. Once again, talking about Christ. Verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Watch this now, and I'll close with this. Circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, Bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. I got news for you. Ethnic differences and racism, okay, has been around a long, long, long time before America was even thought of. Before the first Africans were taken from Africa, it's been around a lot longer than that. Don't kid yourself, okay? This is how the Bible talks about that. 
Back in Paul's day, Greeks and Jews didn't get along. Oh, by the way, Greeks and Jews were under the control of the Roman Empire in those days. But they didn't get along. Barbarians, nobody liked barbarians. They shunned them. Watch this now. Scythian shunned them as well. They didn't get along with barbarians. Okay? Bond or free. You had some people that were in bondage, some people that had to work in bondage and indentured servitude. You had those that had their own freedoms, their own lands and possessions. At times, they did not get along. But notice the word but there. But Christ is all and in all. Here's the thing that Christ says about that. He doesn't care what color your skin is. He doesn't care what nation you're from. Okay? If you are a born-again Christian, whether you are white, black, red, yellow, mixed, brown, we go all the way down that list. Red, all the way down that list. If you are a born-again Christian, and folks from those ethnic or race backgrounds are born again Christians, they are your brother and sister in Christ. And there is no discussion. That's how God views that, friend. It is a no debate. They are your brother in Christ. I remember we used to, we've had the, the guys from the Philippines, the missionaries, that have come over and preached for us. They try to raise up money, they go back to their uh, country in the Philippines and try to build churches, uh, build children's centers and things like that. Basically, what they're trying to do is build churches, fellowship halls, parsonages, run band ministries. They're actually mirroring what we do in America, okay? But they'll come over here. But they say, they love the Lord as much as I do. And even though they're from the Philippines, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of them has actually brought their wives and their families over with them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. We had a man that uh, went to Africa. I think his name, first name was Isaac Lillay. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I could have got that wrong. But he was a missionary, okay, from Africa. He came over and basically was doing the same thing that the guys in the Philippines did. He was just trying to raise money uh, to get his church built, uh, maybe hopes of a, a fellowship hall or a motorized transportation to bring people to church. But guess what? Isaac loved the Lord as much as I did. He's as much a Christian as I am. He's my brother in Christ. I remember Bolina Wilson uh, in the church in First Free Will Baptist in Marion. She was a missionary to India. And I always remember this. I was only about 10, 9 or 10 years old when this happened. I, I had, had been saved long, so it had to be after uh, uh, February of uh, 1980, I believe. But, but anyways, she brought, she has a, had a school over there where she was trying to train her and another man a couple, I should say a couple other missionaries were trying to train those Indian preachers how to preach the gospel and help them out with that. Because you got to realize there was some language issues. You're talking about the late 70s, okay? So she actually had a preaching school over there, which is still in existence today, by the way. Anyways, she brought one of those guys back to America, you know, and, and to help him and, and let him visualize what we do in America. Once again, church sanctuary, uh, Fellowship Hall Parsonage, uh, Sunday School Department, uh, band ministries, okay? She brought him over so he could see that and, and watch how that worked, all right? And she brought him over and she asked Dad, she said, uh, Preacher, uh, because Bolina was a singer, she'd never been married. She pretty much sold her life out to the Lord. I mean, she was a, uh, as missionary as missionary could be, okay? But, but anyways, uh, she asked Dad, would you care if he stayed with you? Dad said, that's fine. He stay with us. So he stayed with us in the parsonage. Okay? And I remember the one thing that, that you remember, I remember bits and pieces of it. The one thing that, that Dad will always tell you that he remembers his first day in America. You know, Dad takes him in a car, takes him around, and he starts to explain to him. Now, there was a little bit of a language barrier. But, but he begins to explain to him what, what in America has worked as far as evangelizing and winning folks to the Lord. Talk about the church sanctuary. Uh, what's expected there, your fellowship halls, your children's ministries, Sunday school, uh, parsonages for the man of God to, to, to help him out, and, and then the, the, the band ministries. And he was explaining all that to that guy. 
And, and Dad said what he kept saying was he would look around, he would listen to Dad, he'd look around and say, man, he'd say Americans are rich. Americans are rich. Okay? I remember at church, uh, Dad would take him to some homes of some of the, the, the congregation, you know, like deacons and trustees that would give him uh, some advice and, you know, uh, what deacons do at church, what trustees do. And Dad thought it's best that uh, he hears it from the actual men who serve on the boards. Same thing with Sunday school teachers. Men or women, he'd take them out, the, he'd take him out in the evening time, and he'd sit down and talk to them, you know, about Sunday school teachers, things like that. Americans are rich. Americans are rich. He wasn't just talking. Now watch this now. He wasn't just talking about possessions. He wasn't talking about just money. He wasn't talking just about home. What he also meant in his Americans are rich thing was the way God has blessed us with the abilities that we have to reach out with the gospel. Like a church sanctuary that's air conditioned. A fellowship hall where we get together and have meals. The parsonage where the preacher can live. The Sunday schools where children can come for Sunday school. The vans that can go pick up. That's what he was inferring to as well. That Americans are rich. But he was my brother in Christ. He was from India. Didn't matter. He saved as Jesus Christ. He's my brother in Christ. That's how God sees that. That's how we as God's people need to start seeing that. Regardless of race, ethnic background, if they love the Lord and they're mine, uh, they, they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They are my brothers and sisters in Christ, period. Like Jesus told his disciples one time. The disciples came up to him and said, you got these guys casting out devils in your name. What should we do about that? And Jesus said, hey, look, if they not be against us and they're for us on our side, we need to pray for them. They're your brothers in Christ. Okay? We are to love the Lord Jesus Christ with our mind, soul, body, and spirit. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus said, people will know that you're mine when you love one another or love the brother. Okay? Regardless. Think about it. God bless you for being with us tonight. Appreciate you being here. And follow us, I should say, on Facebook. We will be back on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock with the Kenny and Sister Kathy. And then I will be on at 6.30 next Sunday morning. We'll be following the same uh, guidelines. And if something changes, and we can open things up a little bit more. We're going to do that, okay? Uh, we're going to see what the governor has to say and go from there. All right, be praying for a lot of churches. I talked to some area pastors today. Uh, some churches have opened up. Some are waiting until next Sunday. So remember a lot of churches in your prayers. I mean, a lot of churches next Sunday, maybe their first Sunday opened up, and pray that God, you know, will be a blessing on their services and help those preachers and those congregations out. And like we said, we're all in this together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all you do for us. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the book of Colossians and what we've learned from it. Go with us now uh, as we get back uh, to, to doing our routines. And, and a lot of many of us are going to go back to work tomorrow and face the week. Father, we pray that some things have been taught on here tonight and preached on here tonight will be a benefit and a help as we face the days and, and the weeks ahead. I pray for our governor. Uh, Father, he's, he's, he's doing the best that he can. Father, I pray that you continue to give him wisdom and guidance and and help him out. I know he wants things back to normal more than anybody. And I say, and I feel very confident saying the president feels the same way. He's made that well known that he wants to, that people can get back to work and get back to a normal way of living and, and begin to take care of themselves because that's what we want to do. And Father, I pray you continue to give them wisdom and guidance, even our local leaders here. Watch over our first responders, those that are in the healthcare field uh, that are, you know, right there on the front line doing what they're doing every day. Uh, we've even had some here in our area. That, that deal with them. I, I've got family members, a cousin uh, that's up in, in a big city that's, that's dealing with this every day. And Father, I pray you continue to have your hedge of protection around them. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, I guess you were just with